Uh, our next speaker is uh, David Grinspoon. He's a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute and an adjunct professor of astrophysical and planetary science at University of Colorado at Boulder. His research focuses on climate evolution on Earth-like planets and potential conditions for life, obviously our topic, elsewhere in the universe. He is involved, uh, has been with several inter interplanetary spacecraft missions for NASA, ESA, and ja Japanese Space Agency. Uh, his popular items have appeared in many journals and media forms. He's also a musician, and uh, you know his band just happens to be the house band of the universe, apparently. Uh, so today he'll be speaking about Venus, which again is having a bit of a renaissance in these discussions, and what we may know and learn about its habitability. Thank you so much for uh, including me in this really fun and um, fascinating conference. I've really been enjoying the talks and um, hopefully um, I won't put you to sleep with mine. I wanna uh, dedicate this talk actually to, uh, in memory of Lynn Margulis, who um, I was reminded died 10 years ago yesterday. Um, and the day that she died, I was gathered with a bunch of astrobiologists um, where we were all on the science team of um, the Mars exploration or, uh, of the uh, uh, Curiosity rover, uh, the Mars Science Laboratory. And we were gathered in Florida for the launch, which happened um, three day, 10 years ago, three days from now. And so um, a bunch of us um, who were close to Lynn uh, were not able to make the funeral because of the, the Mars launch. And so we had a kind of impromptu gathering and I was uh, um, really struck by how many um, notable astrobiologists um, counted Lynn as a, as a major influence, uh, both intellectually and in terms of mentorship. And uh, she's greatly missed. And I think her influence on astrobiology um, remains and maybe is uh, not fully Appreciated. Uh, Lynn was a champion of um, what we might call the whole planet view of habitability. Um, that life was something that became uh, embedded in a planet, became a property of a planet, rather than just something that uh, you'd think of uh, occurring on isolated locales in an otherwise dead or otherwise uninhabited planet. One way to express this view that I've written about is that you might think of life as something that happens to a planet rather than merely something that happens on a planet, a state that a planet becomes. Um, and um, with her colleague, Jim Lovelock, of course, Lynn formulated uh, the Gaia hypothesis, which uh, was a provocative, uh, sometimes needlessly provocative uh, idea because, uh, for instance, in the title of this paper here, atmospheric homeostasis by and for the biosphere, it, there's kind of an implication of teleology, which uh, caused a lot of uh, sort of sideshow distraction, but isn't really an essential part of the Gaia hypothesis or of this whole planet view, which merely posits that life, um, that uh, when life survives in a robust way for billions of years on a planet, it becomes deeply embedded in the functioning of that planet in such a way that uh, to separate the life from the non-living non parts of the planet is not so simple. Um, and um, maybe this is a common or even essential feature of inhabited worlds. We don't know, but uh, you know, another aspect of this of course was um, what we might call the Lovelock criterion for, um, for uh, detecting habitability, which was the idea of searching for atmospheric disequilibrium um, as a um, sign of uh, inhabitants. Uh, it's not generally referred to as the Lovelock criterion, even though we all use it, but I think it probably should be. But at any rate, um, uh, this, uh, these ideas have, have lingered and have been influential. And I'm going to, a little bit later in this talk, return to this whole planet uh, view of life. But now I wanna turn to the question of Venus and why we think uh, what we think about it. Historically, before the space age, but after the Copernican revolution, Venus was regarded as probably a very similar planet to Earth and probably a very promising home for life. Uh, here's a, uh, for instance, an article from the New York Times in 1928 that uh, quotes the great uh, Dr. Uh, Eddington, professor of astronomy at Cambridge, 
Arthur Eddington, uh, in, in a book um, where he, he points out that Venus, so far as is known, would be well adapted for life similar to ours. The planet is about the same size near the sun, but probably not warmer and possesses an atmosphere of satisfactory density, so on. Then he goes on uh, to talk about how uh, Mars uh, you know, could possibly support life as well, but is probably a planet long past its prime. Um, you know, which also was a popular idea back then. So uh, Venus was, uh, for much of the 20th century, right up to the space age, seen as a very promising home for life. But of course, all hopes were dashed um, in 1963 when Mariner 2, the first spacecraft to actually go to another planet, um, with the first experiment successfully conducted at another planet, proved that Venus was very hot on the surface. And right after that, in February 1963, here's... Uh, a, an editorial in the New York Times entitled Venus Says No, um, and uh, about the great disappointment of these results of Mariner 2. Um, and um, you can see at the bottom right here, the end of the article, uh, Mars now remains our only hope. Um, the message from Venus may mark the beginning of the end of mankind's grand romantic dreams. So, um, you know, so what a bummer that was to find out that Venus was the beginning of the end of our grand romantic dreams. And I think that the sort of stain from that being knocked off this hopeful pedestal has colored the way a lot of people think about Venus and astrobiology for um, for a long period of time and has contributed to um, the dearth of missions to Venus, which uh, fortunately now um, is uh, starting to thaw and we have a, a, a promising decade coming up. Um, part of the reason for that is has to do with exoplanets and the fact that exoplanet scientists have expressed a lot of interest in Venus because we realize that there are a lot of planets that um, are probably um, somewhat inside the conventional habitable zone and maybe in what we might call a Venus zone. And trying to understand the boundary between those zones and what happens to a planet. And if it, a planet may have what I call metastable habitability, that is exist in this zone for some period of time, maybe even for billions of years uh, in a habitable state. Um, th these are worthy questions. And, and just the exoplanet community has come to realize that we can't begin to fathom the state of uh, Earth-sized planets elsewhere, uh, light years away, if we haven't done a good job of inv investigating the one right next door. So it's a, uh, you know, they've, I think that's given us additional impetus to those of us in the, uh, the Venus community that have been advocating for missions forever. And uh, now things are for us are looking up. Um, and I'll try to convince you that's for good reason. Um, a key question in thinking about habitability on Venus is, um, what was the potential longevity of a potential early ocean on Venus? Now, early work on this uh, was done by Jim Casting, and he came up with a very rough number of maybe half a billion years for an ocean to be lost from Venus. But in many ways, those early studies were optimized to get rid of an ocean quickly. Um, the calculations really produced an upper limit on surface temperatures, largely because the clouds were excluded. And clouds were excluded because clouds are really hard to model. So the, all uh, they, uh, these early models, all they did was paint an albedo on the surface and assume there was some fraction of cloudiness and then didn't worry about cloud feedbacks. Now, when you start including cloud feedbacks, things change. And generally, we find that clouds stabilize the uh, lower the surface temperature and stabilize um, a uh, moist greenhouse ocean on Venus for potentially long periods of time. I did some early work on this um, problem, uh, just 1D radiative models, but including cloud feedbacks uh, in the uh, 2000s. And um, we found that oceans, uh, we, we said, could persist for a couple of billion years. Uh, and also that the early uh, atmosphere may have been oxygenated, which is kind of interesting from a biological point of view. Now, new results by Mike Way et al., and, and I'm one of the et al.'s, um, suggest, uh, in fact, that Venus may have been a habitable planet for much of solar system history. And the gist of this work, um, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but basically when you use a uh, GCM, Earth-style general circulation model, to try to understand the climate history of Venus, then um, 
the clouds become very important. And in particular, if this planet is a slow rotator, which Venus is, then the clouds organize themselves in a very interesting way so that the subsolar hemisphere is permanently clouded and the anti-solar hemisphere is permanently clear. And those are prime conditions to keep a planet cool because the clouds basically act as a reflector on the day side, yet allow efficient cooling on the night side. And this seems to be a pretty robust uh, a pretty robust result as long as uh, the planet is a slow rotator. And from this, one gets much longer um, lifetimes of an ocean on early Venus, uh, several billion years, in fact. And one interesting consequence of this is that it means if you think of that barrier between the habitable zone and the Venus zone, in extrasolar planetary systems, it may depend not just on planetary size and insulation, but may depend crucially on planetary rotation. So there may be different boundaries of that depending on the rotational state of these uh, planets with, with thick atmospheres. So um, this is just kind of a, a really fascinating thing to consider. Now, uh, there of course is a wrinkle. People have questioned rightfully, was there ever an ocean to begin with on Venus. The first atmospheres of, of um, all these rocky planets were silicate briefly, and then they were steam. Um, and during that steam atmosphere phase, an atmosphere could be very vulnerable to loss. And there's been some question about whether um, there was enough of an extreme ultraviolet flux early on and whether the solar insulation was enough to just sort of puff up the atmosphere enough to so that hydrodynamic escape and other um, uh, loss processes basically made the atmosphere go away before it had time to condense into an ocean. Um, it's an open question. There was a lot of publicity about this recent paper uh, by Turbay et al. Um, in, in Nature, day-night cloud asymmetry prevents early oceans on Venus, but not on Earth. Uh, and it's uh, a worthy paper, but it's certainly not the last word, as the authors would admit. And as a lot of people have pointed out, there many assumptions here, um, and it's it, it's hard to model this. Uh, they basically concluded that a slow rotating planet uh, early on would be more susceptible to losing its atmosphere. And I, I'm not gonna go into the details, but the, it's all about the details of these these uh, GCMs, which are, uh, it's, it's not settled science. And, and there, you can see there's a sort of a clickbaity headline that was in Forbes here about this, chances for life on Venus diminish in new study. And, um, you know, journalists really want to, every study, they want to say, oh, there is life, there isn't life, but, you know, we, uh, we don't know. Um, and um, this is very much an open question and very much a motivation for our future missions, um, both was there an ocean to begin with, and if so, what are the clues as to how long it persisted? Um, I'm going to skip this. This is just more about the possible loss of an early ocean, which I already kind of described. Um, but there's, there's another wrinkle to this. There's a, a new paper by Dan Bauer and colleagues, and this is actually, it's on the archive, but it's not published yet, but it's submitted to Planetary Science Journal. But if you're interested in this, I, I urge you to find it on the archive. Retention of water in terrestrial magma oceans and carbon-rich early atmospheres. I also heard Dan Bauer give a talk about this later, uh, late recently. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the gist is that it's not entirely clear whether um, a magma ocean will always generate a thick steam atmosphere. Um, because in addition to outgassing of steam, you have ingassing where um, water is dissolved in magmas. And crucially, it turns out it depends on the oxygen fugacity of the mantle and it can go either way. And the net result, um, these authors conclude, is that the early water, you know, this question, this question of uh, was, the, was the early water on the surface or in the atmosphere? The answer may be neither. It was mostly in the interior. That's the conclusion here, that, that a lot of water initially gets stored in the interior and outgasses later throughout the history of the planet. That's crucial here because it's the, during that early phase of Venus's history when the extreme ultraviolet flux from the sun was stripping away and causing this massive hydrodynamic flow of hydrogen. That's when the planet was most vulnerable to water loss. So if this model is true, then uh, that phase may have passed and then the water sort of outgassed afterwards and then you had a long-lived ocean. So all of this is to say 
um, it's up in the air and we really need these new missions to answer this important question of uh, existence and longevity of oceans on Venus. The data we have up to this point uh, is circumstantial. We know that D to H ratio is telling us a lot of water was lost, but we don't know when. It doesn't necessarily mean there was surface water. There are formation models that mostly suggest Venus and Earth probably got roughly similar endowments. Um, and um, there are various climate models, most of which suggest that the that young Venus uh, with the young sun um, should have been able to support liquid water. But uh, this early phase I was describing with the extreme uh, activity of the sun is uh, something that's not well characterized. So future missions will tell us, but it's certainly plausible given the way it all results and other recent results that for much of solar system history, Venus had warm surface oceans and uh, probably the other qualities that we think of as necessary for habitability. So it may be that for over 2 billion years, our solar system had two neighboring terrestrial planets with habitable surface oceans. So that's just kind of a mind blowing picture. If you think of what was happening on earth during those billions of years, the origin of life, the or, you know, photosynthesis, um, complex ecosystems and all that. Uh, for all we know, Venus could have had similar or more accelerated or less accelerated evolution. We just, we have no idea, but it's enticing that there could have been these two planets. And of course, uh, if, if they were just next door uh, to habitable uh, worlds for billions of years, you know, to some degree, they were probably exchanging material. And that opens up all kinds of other possibilities for origin and evolution of life. So uh, I want to switch gears here now and talk about the possibility of extant life on Venus, something I've been talking about for about 25 years. Um, they laughed then. They're still laughing now, but <laughs> maybe not quite as loud. Or There's been a lot of interesting uh, attention um, to this question recently, which I'm um, I've been really enjoying. Uh, the, the basic idea is that during an extended period of water loss, Venus um, quite possibly had a habitable surface and maybe even an, an oxygenated atmosphere due to hydrogen loss. When young, the terrestrial planets were constantly exchanging material, thus forming what we might consider to be a, a polybiosphere, a biopolysphere, I don't know. Uh, favorable environmental conditions um, existed as far as we know for the origin or transplantation of life. And then there's the big question as surface conditions became hostile, could life have adapted to an atmospheric niche under directional selection? Um, and the uh, a salient fact here is that the cloud region, unlike the surface, is quite clement today. Um, if you look at the um, region of the um, lower clouds, it's roughly the same temperature and pressure um, there as it is probably in the room you're sitting in now. That is um, it certainly overlaps sur average surface temperature and average surface pressure of Earth in the clouds. So those conditions are, um, are enticing. Um, and there are other properties of the clouds that are interesting in, in this light. Um, you might say, well, clouds are not a good place for life. On Earth, there are no known organisms that live out their entire life cycle in the clouds, although we're still looking and there are organisms that live par at least partially in the clouds. But the global clouds on Venus are larger, more continuous, and more stable than the clouds on Earth. And the particle lifetimes are generally much longer. In some places, it seems maybe the particles don't fall at all because of dynamics. So if you just need uh, an environment that's stable enough so that you have a reproductive time scale shorter than the destruction time scale of the particles, then Venus may be more promising. There are also these strange mode three particles, which are in the lower clouds, and they make up actually the bulk of the mass of the cloud deck. And um, they, we don't know what they are. They're not pure sulfuric acid. They seem to contain some other core material. There's suggestions that they are non-spherical, so there may be solid particles, and their optical properties are not consistent with pure sulfuric acid. So they seem to have um, something else coated with sulfuric acid. And this may actually be the bulk of the mass of the cloud deck. Um, there's chemical disequilibrium. And if you um, want to be a uh, photosynthesizer, then the super rotation means that it's never night for very long in the clouds. Um, less than two days, Earth days. 
So um, there's also these uh, very strange uh, unknown ultraviolet absorbers, uh, a substance in the clouds that we don't know what it is, but it absorbs more than half the solar energy striking the planet. Um, and it has high temp temporal and spatial variability. And um, a long time ago, I suggested that it might be that it has properties in common with a biological pigment. If you could imagine something that could uh, evolve to take advantage of ultraviolet uh, radiation, um, and people have speculated a little bit on what that might be, then there's tons of energy up there. And uh, uh, this is obviously highly speculative, but it remains unidentified after decades of attempting to um, pin down the composition of this stuff. Um, and there are, uh, there's the possibility of phototrophy. And there was actually a paper that just came out on this by Rakesh uh, Mogul and others pointing out that the radiation fluxes throughout the cloud deck um, are uh, very healthy uh, for uh, potential uh, phototrophic organisms. Um, and there's a possibility of chemotrophy. There are um, sources of um, potential um, free energy sources of disequilibrium chemicals, I won't go into detail of this, but, but uh, the observations of carbon and sulfur um, compounds, which um, may, uh, you know, could potentially uh, provide metabolic energy. Um, I'm going to skip this just in the interest of time. Um, and there have been some speculative papers on how organisms could possibly uh, get along in the Venus atmosphere. Here's one that that I wrote with uh, Dirk schulz makut and, and, and colleagues um, about the possibility of using sulfur for both a sun shield and a, uh, a way to uh, utilize ultraviolet radiation. Uh, there are earth organisms that use um, elemental sulfur as sunscreens. And, and um, elemental sulfur also, uh, by the way, can uh, potentially be a, a cellular shield against uh, concentrated sulfuric acid, it's been pointed out. So. Um, and here's another uh, paper by uh, Sarah Seeger and colleagues um, speculating on a possible life cycle for organisms in the clouds. Uh, they pointed out, you know, beneath the main cloud deck, there's a uh, unobserved subcloud haze. Again, we don't know what the subcloud haze is, but they speculated that if there was something um, in in the cloud decks living in cloud particles and then um, reproducing through spores, those spores could fall into the subcloud haze and, and be convectively raised back into the clouds where they would serve as cloud condensation nuclei and sort of grow their own new cloud habitats. Uh, again, highly speculative, uh, but these papers are fun and useful as proof of concept. But what we really need, of course, is further exploration to understand if um, these plausibility arguments um, lead to actual possibility. Um, there has been, I mentioned, a lot of recent attention. There was just a special issue of astrobiology um, with a um, collection from the first workshop on habitability of the cloud layer, which occurred a couple of years ago. And that is, um, uh, there, that is an open access um, collection, which you can read in astrobiology. And also next week is the next Venera D uh, Venus cloud habitability system workshop, uh, a virtual workshop, which is free and you can register um, and attend. And if you wanna hear an even better version of this talk, you'll be sure and catch uh, catch me, but there'll be a lot of good speakers you haven't heard. Um, so um, what about objections to extant life in the clouds of Venus? Um, one, and Chris McKay asked me this the first time I talked to him about it, and I love this question. Why aren't the clouds green on Earth? If you can have cloud life, then life is so opportunistic. Why aren't the clouds green? And as I mentioned earlier, it's a great question, but it may be that the clouds of Venus in some ways are much more suitable for life because they're so much more stable and continuous. Um, clouds are strong acid. Uh, it's a good point. We don't know the low pH limit of terrestrial life. Um, we keep finding acidophiles, but we, we don't know of anything that can survive in the clouds of Venus. Um, the high UV flux could be a curse, but it could also potentially be a blessing uh, if organisms learn to use it. And the flux diminishes rapidly into the lower clouds. And uh, are there biogenic elements? Well, it turns out there are. Um, first of all, the acid I mentioned, uh, here's Penny Boston in these 
um, caves in, um, in Mexico that are so acidic, she needs gloves to keep from burning her hands and they're loaded with organisms. And, you know, we know, uh, we know organisms that thrive in pH zero, uh, but we don't know organisms that thrive in the, uh, the, the negative pH conditions of the Venus clouds. If they are uniformly that acidic, which there's good reason to think they may not be. Um, and it's been pointed out that acidophilic uh, properties are deeply embedded in the tree of life on earth that um, uh, acidophilia, acidophilicity <laughs> is, uh, is a common response to a common evolutionary response to various um, evolutionary, um, to various environments. Um, and um, even in the, pressure, in the presence of high temperatures, low temperatures, high salt, low water activity, and furthermore, it's, it's, there's a wide range of conditions in which acidophile organisms thrive. Um, none of this proves anything except for um, suggests that we um, keep our minds open about this. Um, the biogenic elements, actually, it turns out there is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and uh, to some extent, some unknown degree, but so, uh, to some degree, phosphorus. And it seems as though uh, we don't have great observations. We're hoping to have better ones soon, but especially uh, with the, some of the Venera, the Russian Venera missions, it's been observed um, things like uh, manganese, manganese um, and iron um, and uh, um, magnesium and suspected, you can see at the bottom, there's a long list of uh, mercury and lead and a lot of, um, elements are suspected. You may say, well, what are those things doing up in the clouds? But remember, it's, um, it, it's uh, you know, 735 Kelvin at the surface. So a lot of elements are volatile and uh, at those temperatures and involved in uh, atmospheric processes and circulations. Um, now, an important objection and one that's been raised recently is this the water activity in in the clouds uh, may be incompatible with life. And this is a paper that came out recently in Nature Astronomy um, and it's an important topic, but I think that the, um, the, honestly, I think the title of this paper is a little bit clickbaity. They didn't have to use the word uninhabitable. And in the, um, second, uh, the second sentence of the abstract is something that's just not true. However, such analyses usually neglect the role of water activity, which is a measure of relative uh, inhabitability. That's actually, uh, if these authors had gone to some of the workshops about cloud habitability, they would understand that, wa that water activity has been commonly discussed and commonly written about as, as a potential limit on life on Venus. So it's not like, aha, you guys are neglecting this. No. Um, so um, that was unfortunate. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate point. Any organism on Venus would have to overcome a massive, uh, if it's an aqueous organism, would have to overcome a massive deficit of water. And people have written um, some papers on how this could happen with ion pump, pumps and, and so forth. But uh, I'll also point out that I, I think this paper is a little overconfident. If you look at their big table, they have here the, um, at every altitude, they have the sulfuric acid concentration to a 10th of a percent. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, what observations are they using? I didn't know we knew the numbers to that degree. And then, and then if you look at the source of this and you have to read the fine print and literally I needed a magnifying glass, it turns out they're referring to, it has nothing to do with any observation of the atmosphere of Venus, the references to a physical chemistry paper from 1964. Um, so it's, uh, you know, this is just sort of overconfident about what we know actually know about the clouds of Venus. Are the clouds uniformly composed of concentrated sulfuric acid? Almost surely not. I already mentioned the uh, Pioneer Venus results, results showing that mode free particles are likely non-spherical and seem to be comprised of some other unknown substance coated with sulfuric acid. But it's also true in, whoops, and this has been pointed out recently in a um, really great paper by Paul Rimmer and colleague that large depletions of water and sulfur dioxide in and above the clouds are unexplained and may be inconsistent with uniform sulfuric acid cloud composition. They may require, it, they seem to require some chemistry going on in the clouds that we don't know what it is, but it may require particle populations with more neutral uh, pH containing, Rimmer suggests, dissolved salts or other unknown components. Um, 
So we don't know. This is another reason to explore the clog level environment. Um, and this leads to a lot of interesting questions for future missions. Um, what is the uh, unknown absorber? Uh, what is the equilibrium state of the cloud level atmosphere? What are the mode three cloud particles? Inquiring minds want to know. Um, what trace const constituents are in the clouds in the surrounding atmosphere, including trace biogenic elements, trace metals, disequilibrium compounds, uh, such as, uh, dare I say it, phosphine, question um, mark. Origin and history uh, of the atmosphere, um, which we can really learn a lot from uh, with uh, the noble gases and their isotopes, which we're going, we're going to measure uh, with a mission called Da Vinci that we're launching in 2029. Um, the existence and the longevity of oceans on Venus, there are many um, relevant observations that we haven't made yet that we're, we're going to be soon. And how does the atmospheric circulation affect cloud particle lifetimes? There are other questions, but these are some of my favorites. Now, I mentioned phosphine and I really didn't wanna mention phosphine. Uh, to me, it's not central to this topic, it's potentially a distraction. Um, so, but then I had in my notes, I said, you have to have some commentary on phosphine. And so I literally just cut and pasted my notes right here. This is my only slide on this topic. It has in my mind, never been part of the rationale for considering a plausible biosphere on Venus. Um, there've been some silly headlines, life found on Venus, and then no life on Venus after all, both of which are uh, not very um, credible. Uh, it's important not to have an overly prescriptive or dogmatic approach towards what may or may not be a biosignature. The important thing is that we try to communicate clearly and encourage the same amongst our colleagues in the media. So phosphine, we don't know. It's um, under dispute. If it is there, it's obviously not clearly a biosignature, but it might signal some unusual chemistry. Uh, it's been flagged as a potential biosignature um, in um, in work that preceded this observation um, for on, on work about exoplanets. So if it's there, it's interesting and we have to try to understand it. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about phosphine right now. Um, now, I wanna shift gears for uh, my remaining few minutes back to um, the topic I started with where I alluded to uh, Lynn Margulis and the whole, whole planet view of habitability because the thing that got me really thinking and writing about the possibility of extant life on Venus was not merely the existence of a zone in the clouds, which uh, has potentially more clement conditions, but it was really this image on the right, which was, this was the first press release image from the Magellan mission, which orbited Venus from 1990 to 1994 and gave us our first global view of Venus. It gave us sort of our Mariner 9 view of Venus, which arguably is what we're still working with and waiting for the next steps. By the way, Mariner 9 was also 50 years ago uh, last month. Um, so a lot of interesting anniversaries. Um, what, we, what made this provoke ideas about life to me was the fact that as soon as we got the Magellan images down and started to look at them and piece together maps and so forth, it became clear that Venus had a very unusual and active geologic history. There's a relatively young surface um, and that this had consequences for the climate and the atmosphere, which I was a postdoc when this happened and much of my career since then, uh, a big chunk of it has been involved in trying to construct climate models that include the surface and the atmosphere processes on Venus to really understand what's going on. But clearly, just looking at the craters of Venus and the fact that you can see here, there are some uh, craters superimposed on a crater-free uh, smooth volcanic surface. Um, and they're not that many craters. And if you do a global map, um, you see that um, a few things, there are not that many craters, the average age is less than a billion years. And also it's weird how uniformly distributed they are compared to say Mars, where you can see older areas in the South and younger areas in the North. Venus to first order has all the same surface age as if uh, something happened relatively recently geologically. And we're still trying to puzzle through that. But over on the right here, if you look at a cartoon of planetary history done by Jim Head several years ago, it's clear that Venus, like Earth, has most of its surface, most of its rocks uh, created in the last half a billion years. And unlike 
almost anywhere else under unlike any other rocky surface in the solar system. So in that crude but tantalizing sense, Venus uh, is like Earth alive, whereas most other rocky worlds we know are dead. And this impression was um, furthered when we looked at a lot more Magellan images and saw the range of volcanic um, features, some of which seem very recent and with uh, Pioneer, uh, with uh, Venus Express and then Akatsuki results showing um, circumstantial evidence for recent or ongoing volcanism on Venus and also just an incredibly dynamic um, atmosphere. So this planet in, uh, in the geological and meteorological sense is, uh, is um, extraordinary, extraordinarily vibrant and, uh, and, and alive, at least in, uh, in those metrics. Now, what does that mean for the possibility of life on the planet? Well, this got me thinking, first of all, the implications for the, the climate, um, because I realized that if the surface was active, it meant there was outgassing, which meant um, the clouds were being actively sourced. But then there are also chemical reactions between atmospheric gases and the surface. And those chemical reactions are um, temperature dependent, both the equilibrium state and the kinetics, which leads to all kinds of possible weird feedbacks between the climate and the geology and the chemical state of the surface and the atmosphere. So we decided to model those and we started doing what we call Venus system science, where we tried to look at all the connections between the atmosphere, the surface, the clouds, and so forth. Uh, and this is an effort that um, that is uh, still ongoing. But uh, in order to do this, we, uh, my colleagues and I created what we called the Venus climate model, where we um, it was a time stepping model that included a radiative convective atmospheric model, uh, volcanic outgassing, surface reactions, diffusion into the surface, uh, cloud microphysics, and all these in, in coupled modules, which then we can alter and and play with and experiment with, um, and. Uh, oh, this is just on the right, bottom right, a schematic of some of the feedbacks that we included. And we found some really interesting behavior. And I'm not going to go into all the results of this now, but, um, but the idea of Venus as a vibrant place where active geochemical cycles are determining the properties of the atmosphere, clouds, and surface as they are on Earth, but nowhere else, arguably, in the solar system. Um, has been uh, confirmed and it has led to uh, obviously a lot that we want to observe with the upcoming missions. Um, but one point that I'll point out is that we concluded from this that the clouds are actively sourced from outgassing on the surface, that if outgassing stopped for uh, 50 to 100 million years, the clouds would probably go away, which is fascinating to me because it means if you go out tonight and you should, and look to the west at dusk, and Venus is near maximum elongation right now, that you can, with your naked eyes, see evidence of active volcanism on Venus, because without it, the clouds might not be there. Now, um, what does this mean for life? Well, briefly, getting back to this whole planet view of habitability, um, there's a traditional set of criteria for habitability, where we think of life as a phenomenon that requires physical conditions which overlap those on Earth, temperature, pressure, pH, presence of water. And if all those are met, then there could be life in a place. Uh, and the key is the presence of liquid water. Now that's reasonable, but it's interesting to note since we're um, challenged by having only one biosphere and we're, we ought to be worried about the assumptions, that the wrong assumptions that can lead to, are there alternative criteria and this has led me to something that I've called the living world hypothesis, which obviously owes a big debt to Lynn Margulis. And that, that is that life is inherently a planetary scale phenomena with a cosmological lifespan and, it, and sustained and vigorous geochemical, except geochemical spelled correctly, cycling will support the evolution of a robust biosphere. And, and therefore life it may be something that requires internally driven geological activity uh, marked by flagrant chemical disequilibrium in the atmosphere as Earth has, and that the key then is Earth's uniquely vigorous geological and chemical activity. Now, maybe this is completely wrong. It's just, it's meant as an alternative hypothesis. Um, but it does mean that Venus potentially has rare, planet, rare planetary properties of astrobiological interest as our only other example of an Earth-sized and um, currently active terrestrial planet with a mostly young surface 
uh, where the endogenous geological activity and surface chemistry are to some degree controlling the atmosphere and climate, then we have to ask if we think beyond the specifics of a particular chemical system, um, what properties an inhabited planet might possess. And the answers might include an atmosphere with signs of flagrant chemical disequilibrium, uh, an active internally driven cycling of volatile elements. And the two planets we know of at present, which possess these characteristics are Earth and Venus. Um, on Earth, life exists at the interface between two powerful and permanent convective heat engines. Um, one uh, driven by the heat in the Earth, one driven by the sun in the atmosphere. Perhaps this is not just lucky, but an essential condition for a biosphere. Where else in the solar system is this condition met? Well, for instance, it's not met on Mars today in terms of the internal activity. Um, it's not met on really any other rocky planet. Um, it's arguably met on Titan. And um, it's arguably met on Venus. Um, so I want to end here, but I'll just point out that, that all ideas about extraterrestrial life are extrapolations from a single example. Um, and so it, it's important for us to resist groupthink. And um, I think sometimes some potential locales for life become more acceptable through repetition. It's plausible that life exists within the ocean of an ice covered world that has never seen sunlight. It's plausible that life exists underground within a planet that is lar largely geological dead. And my, don't worry, I'm finishing up. And it's plausible that life exists within the clouds of a planet with vibrant chemical flows, energy sources, stable aqueous environments, and so forth. So among the plausible niches for extraterrestrial life in our solar system, the clouds of Venus are among the most accessible and the least well explored. And all I was going to do after this was um, describe briefly the missions we have coming up, but our previous speakers have ably done that. So you know about them. And so I will stop here and thank you for listening. Great, thank you, David. It's wonderful to think of Venus as not just a hellscape with sulfuric acid rain, but kind of a, a potential uh, host for life and much more vibrant. Um, we're, Almost a time, but I think we have time for a few questions. Um, for instance, Victor Toth has kind of an interesting thought experiment of how, well, how would a slow rotator Earth manifest itself, do you think? What implications might that have and how would that relate? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so thinking off the top of my head on this really good question, the crucial thing that a slow rotator seems to do is move the um, this boundary of the habitable zone inward potentially because of its effect on cloud dynamics. So if that's the key, then arguably it may not, have, at least in terms of those dynamical considerations, it may not have changed things much because Earth was already sort of in that zone. Now, of course, um, one could imagine all kinds of other effects that it would have on um, evolution of climate and life getting into it. And, and Earth's rotational state is inextricable from it, from the Earth moon system, which, you know, is something very unique to Earth, the momentum state of that. So a, a, a second level answer would be, gee, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> Let's talk about it over a beer. But to first order, the critical thing is that it actually puts Venus in the same bin as Earth. And I don't think it would take Earth out of that bin to be a slow rotator. Great, thanks. And then maybe quickly some thoughts on uh, the Mr. UV absorber. Uh, is it, could it be a complex organic assembly known as red oil? Ah, you see Stephen's question. Yes, I'm glad you asked that, Stephen, um, because as you know, your um, associate, Jan um, Spacek, has um, done some very recent interesting model, which is up on the archive. So I guess we can talk about it, though I think it's not published yet where they've re-looked at the question. I mean, it's been so vexing, try to understand, is it a chlorine compound? Is it a sulfur compound? It almost fits, but doesn't quite. They went back um, and having the advantage of not being Venus people, but um, uh, Steve and, and, and Jan said, hey, well, could it be organic? And people naturally think, oh, there can't be anything organic in Venus's atmosphere because ultraviolet light destroys it. But it turns out that there's this compound called red oil that, um, that gets produced when you put organics in 
ultraviolet or light and then and then becomes rather stable against ultraviolet decomposition and against sulfuric acid. And so this is a recent proposition um, and I'm intrigued by it. I, I, I don't know how to judge it fully not being an organic chemist, but I welcome the new idea that Steve is referring to and I'm glad that it's now out on archive. It's brand new. I encourage people to look at it. Maybe Steve, maybe in fact, you could pop the, uh, the reference to the archive paper in the chat if you would, but um, anybody uh, wants to look at it and take a shot at it and let me know what you think, I'm, uh, I'm intrigued. That's a good new headline, oil discovered on Venus. <laughs> <laughs>